Welcome to the Iowa Gold Star Military Museum. My name is Sherry Colbert and I'm the museum director here. Our museum is about all Iowans. We honor and depict the military service of all of them, not just the Iowa National Guard. We have two great tour guides for you today. They are both Korean War veterans. They will give you a great tour, you'll learn a lot, and we hope that you'll come back again soon. Thank you. This is our commander of the base. And this is Major General Grenville Dodge, who Camp Dodge is named after, a Civil War general. And when we do uh, tours, we usually introduce them before we take them back into the museum. All right, let's go into the museum then. Are you going to turn it over to your battle buddy here? Well, this is, I'm, I'm Jay Chapman. And uh, to, to begin with, welcome to the uh, museum. Uh, this is kind of an important display here, and it's a picture of all Iowans uh, that have received the Medal of Honor. And there's a row clear to the top, the Civil War, and as you can see, there's a little short story. And most of the winners of the uh, Medal of Honor was for capturing the flag, and this would be in the era of about the Civil War. Uh, one of the interesting things about that is that the uh, capturing of the flag got you a Medal of Honor uh, medal, and the Medal of Honor medal was the only medal that they had during uh, the Civil War. But as you can see, uh, the story goes longer and longer. It's much harder now to be awarded the uh, Medal of Honor. It takes an awful lot of backup. It has to be uh, witnessed by uh, at least three people. And uh, again, the Medal of Honor is the highest medal that, that is available. So we'll walk on down this way. And we'll start in here. We talked about the medals. Uh, this display right here is all the medals that is possible to be won. Of course, you can recognize the Silver Star or the uh, Purple Heart. Silver Star. And of course, here, this is the Medal of Honor. As we talk about the museum, it's not to glorify war, it's, it's just to show Iowa veterans, and this museum is dedicated to all Iowa veterans of all wars. And we do uh, have this as a, as a military frontier, and it was the uh, Lewis and Clark, and as you probably would study in school, uh, uh, they were trying to find a waterway that took them from uh, the mid-central part of the uh, of, uh, United States over to the Pacific Ocean. They thought the Missi Missouri River went all the way, but it did, as they turned out, it, it does not go that far. But they did get out to the, to the Pacific Ocean, and they spent a very cold winter, one year at least, uh, in, in, uh, up, up in the uh, Pacific Coast area. As we go down, you can see these uniforms that you see here, those are dress uniforms. Uh, they would not wear those kind of uniforms in an attack or in combat. Um, they're they're, they're way, way too colorful. This is when we established our border with Mexico and Iowans participated in this war. And this is what the uniforms look like. And this is for the rifles and pistols and the swords and so on. And uh, this also shows you Texas and the states down on the uh, Mexican border, how it was back in the days before they established the border. This is the Civil War began in 19, or 1861, and 
this is a uh, diorama or a picture of, of uh, a simulated battle. Incidentally, many of our displays have a uh, a photograph or a painting. Uh, it's done by an, a local individual from uh, Des Moines, Iowa. As you see, this, these are the weapons that they used. Uh, th those had to be loaded uh, in individually. You had to put your uh, wadding in, your powder in, your bullet, the round ball, and they, it's, some of these people are uh, displaying that, uh, how they loaded that weapon. This is the cannon that was used in the, that period. When that cannon was fired, it would jump back quite a ways, and you had to reset it, re re aim it. Inside of here is a, now think about this. This is Civil War, and this, they didn't call them, uh, like uh, Navy, Navy uh, corpsmen that are, that are popular today, but they call them uh, surgeons. And this is what the surgeon carried. Now, when they would, would be wounded in any part of their body, most generally they would remove the leg or the arm and this is the kits that they used on the field. Many improvements have been made, and we can talk about that as we go along. Okay, this is our display of the Spanish-American War from 1898 to 1899. And we had a president that was famous not only as President of the United States, but he was also in the Spanish-American War. His name was Teddy Roosevelt. And he's, he was our general and then eventually became president. And of course, Teddy Roosevelt was famous for the Rough Riders, as they called themselves, up uh, sand, and then when they made a charge against the enemy of, on what they called San Juan Hill, which was a famous battle of this war. Uh, some of the artifacts of the Spanish-American War were new in warfare. For instance, this is a machine gun as it was back then, and it had to be manually cranked. It had a crank on the back, and you actually had to turn it like this to, to make it fire and then the magazine set on top and the, and the shells dropped down into the magazine as they were turning it. But more importantly, uh, at a later time as we go all around, this is a Gat they call it a Gatling gun, and we now have these types of weapons mounted in helicopters and it, it, it's an unbelievable it has the same idea that was in the early 1800s. And then of course this is our mural for the Spanish-American War. All our wars will have a mural uh, of some type. And this is the Spanish-American War mural here. It tells you, gives you a little better idea of what the, the uniforms looked like and the weapons. And the Spanish-American War was the first war that we had a rifle that fired a, a, a round that you put in the magazine. Always before they had to load it by the end of the barrel. They had to put the powder in, then they had to put the shell in, then they had to put the cap on the uh, firing apparatus as they cocked it. And it took, that was quite a process to, just to fire one shell. But later on in this war, they did come with a rifle that fired a, a, uh, 
a cartridge. These two weapons came back from World War I, and they're German. Now, why they came back to the base here was to get technology off of, because we did not have a high-capacity machine gun, which is this weapon right here. This is what they called a heavy machine gun, and it was German, and it came back from World War I, and it's been on the base here. And we did not have, during World War I, a machine gun like this. We had to use the British uh, machine gun because we didn't have one. And the same with this artillery piece. This came back from World War I and was German. As you can see, that mannequin there is a German. And the reason it came back, if you look at this artillery piece over here, which is what we had, it's just a barrel and it has to be loaded from the front and it took extra time to do that. The Germans came up with this idea here where the, the shells were, were loaded in and they, it was hydraulically operated. The top is the barrel and the other uh, bottom there is a piston that takes up the recoil of the unit when it's fired so you don't have to reset it and re-aim it each time you fire it. So that was a big jump in technology. This display here is a uh, mock-up of a barracks in the World War I era. We could walk up and go inside. This shows the bed. Uh, I'm not sure what the the mattress was in those days. I think it was uh, probably stuffed with straw or such. This is the uh, what the individual wore in World War One. In 1918, 1917, uh, in World War One, the flu, and it's kind of uh, interesting that the to talk about the pandemic that we were just still still involved in. But the flu come onto the base and we lost over uh, 700 uh, military soldiers. Uh, it, there was a rumor at one time that they're buried here, but that's, that's not true. They were never buried, uh, uh, buried on this base. This base was built in a very short period of time. It was built within two or three months. Uh, you can see out the window here, uh, look at all the barracks that was built at that particular time. Much of this wood, uh, Camp Dodge was kind of, uh, what period of time, Bob, did they close uh, and, and took all the old wooden barracks down? Uh, it was in the 1920s, late 1920s, early 1930s, and all these wooden barracks were dismantled, and a lot of the lumber was reused in homes that were built in the metropolitan Des Moines area. And then, of course, the base was reformed and redone in, in barracks as it is now. World War One. Uh, they fought what they call the trench war type of operation. And as we go along here, this shows the trench warfare on a continental scale. And it went all the way across, and clear down here. Uh, General Pershing came to this area and decided and, and told the soldiers, you cannot win a war in a, uh, in a trench. Uh, there's some fantastic stories about the German and the Americans. At night, they may go out in no man's land, trade cigarettes, trade stories. Uh, but General Pershing really, really stopped the German or the uh, uh, military 
using a trench warfare type of a thing. We could walk in here and we can stand in here. We have all of the war material that was used. What what the World War One? Uh, they used poisonous gas, a uh, mustard gas. It it killed soldiers. Uh, it, the ones that were not killed right away, they they died at a later time, maybe uh, 10, 15 years later, of of cancer of the throat. Uh, look at the weapons that they used. That, that's like a bayonet, but it's also got what we call the brass knuckles. And that was for hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is a uh, telegraph operation where they transfer information from one place to another. These are the weapons, uh, the hand grenades have not changed very much. Uh, we talked a little bit about the uh, Mustard gas that they used. Uh, these are what our soldiers used to counteract. Um, there's a there's a razor uh, a, a, an article in here about uh, 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 being clean shaven, and of course the purpose of that was was to get a, a good tight fit with your gas mask on. I had an uncle that was uh, gassed in that World War I, that he passed away early 1940s. We have the uh, display of many of the uh, different helmets that was used. These are the German helmets. Uh, they were advanced uh, before, before our helmet was. Our helmet was just a round pot on the top. Uh, th this come down and protected your side of your face, some of your uh, neck. This is a 1918 uh, vehicle. Look at the tires. Uh, there's no inner tubes in those tires. It's just hard rubber tires. This th truck here was used up until about a couple of years ago in parades. It hasn't been uh, running lately. We have a sound that gives you the sound of how it sounded. This is a gas tank. Uh, how would you like to be sitting in this chair, uh, seat up here, and, and you're sitting right close to the gas, and, and not really protected by much of anything? We'll walk in now to World War II. I was 10 years old when World War II started, and I, I followed the war pretty close. Uh, in World War II, it started, of course, in December 7th, uh, 1941, when they bombed Pearl Harbor. And immediately the government, unlike any other war that we ever had, they rationed almost everything. You could not buy shoes, you could not buy gasoline, most foodstuffs, meat. Uh, you, had, you had a little ration book. 
and you had a little, uh, some were coins, and some were just like little paper stamps. And that you had to have that with some money uh, to buy that product. One of the things that they did in World War II is they got everybody involved in the war. And uh, everybody had a victory garden in their, in their yard. Uh, everybody saved tin foil, even gum wrappers. You could sell iron. I, I sold iron at, at two, two dollars or two cents a pound. Uh, you could sell rags. Uh, sold a lot of rags. We would put a brick inside the rags until the guy found out that we were doing that. But we tried to get the rags where they weighed a little more. The old, uh, the old junk guy, he would throw the rags real hard on the floor, and, and if you had a brick in there, it would, it would sound different. This basically shows you a, a map of the United States and Europe and Asia, and we had two fronts during World War II. We were fighting the Japanese on this uh, front over here and the, in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and then in Europe, we were fighting in uh, both Africa and uh, Europe theater. Push one of those stars, Bob, and show how that thing works. Oh, okay. If you come and you wanted to research a period of what was happening like, in 1941, uh, Pearl Harbor, December 7, okay, 1941. No American will ever forget this Sunday morning in Hawaii. It'll go to Pearl Harbor. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war There was an island that his parents gave us, his artifacts. He was a flying tiger. And this tiger also came from his parents, and this was in their barracks in China when they were flying against the Japanese. And here's this young man's picture right here. And this is his uniform back in that era. And his suitcase property of American Volunteer Group, Flight Leader W.N. Reed. This is our memorial from World War II. It shows you this would have been in the Pacific Theater where the Marines were fighting uh, the Japanese and we were invading islands in the Pacific uh, Theater. Zach shows you a, a bunker back there that would have been staffed by Japanese and our Americans had to come in by ship and uh, invade the islands and fight the Japanese and cleared and clear they cleared the islands of the Japanese in the Pacific well the Japanese learned early on that they could not hold them on the, on the beach could not stop them at the beach and that's when they start building the pillboxes back in the inland. Um, our combat, the, the way to get around that is that the flame, they developed the flamethrower and that was a, a gas tank on the back of an individual's back. And he would, the purpose of that, he would run up as close to that opening as he could and he would shoot that flame. Uh, and what was not killed immediately by flame, uh, it, it sucked all the air out of it. it, it they lost all their oxygen. The B-17 was flown in the European theater quite heavily. There was 6,000 
uh, B-17s that was down uh, in, in the European fleet. They lost an awful lot of people uh, in, in, in the uh, air, airplane. Uh. There's actually a Norden bomb site which was used in the bombers to drop the bombs, which is that That's right here. item right there. Uh, these are the boots. The higher you get, the colder it gets. So if you're up at 30,000 feet, you're probably 60 below zero. And I don't think these guys would even work very good at that, even at that temperature. The, the crew that was in the airplane, uh, airplane uh, they carried a sidearm and they were instructed if, if the plane was going to go down, that they would shoot, they would put that uh, weapon in this hole right here and shoot it and it would destroy that because they didn't want this bomb site to fall into the hands of the Germans. This would be the invasion of Normandy on D-Day, 6th of June, 1944. And this would be if you were in a bunker, a German bunker looking down on our invasion of Normandy on D-Day. They built huge concrete, like a platform, and they floated them across the channel. And the reason they did that is is so that boats could walk, could could load up here. This kind of, it gives you a replica. There's a crane there that's unloading and loading to a smaller boat. My brother was here, but he was in the 18th row back. And he, the reason that he was back so far is that his ship was loaded with ammunition and artillery fire. And these little things that look like jacks, uh, those were tank, did, uh, they would try to, try to stop tanks with that. 9,000 9, individuals lost their life within two days on this, on this beach. Bob, tell her about uh, uh, Phillips. John Phillips. <coughs> he was a friend of mine. And he was in the Army, and, but he was also captured and was a POW in Germany during World War II. And these are some artifacts from that era. And this is John's picture here in part of his uniform and you can see one shoulder of the shirt was he was wounded but the Germans operated on him and really saved his life and also he had a bullet hole down here in his and they actually operated and the reason they did they wanted to get information out of him because he was an officer so they operated on him if he'd have been an enlisted man they'd have probably let him die those were the words of John. Now here is what really saved his life. This is the Bible he had in this pocket up here. See the bullet hole in it? And the bullet holes up here in the pocket where he had it. And if those that have went through the Bible, that's over your heart, he surely would have died. But it so happened he had his Bible up in that pocket. Th this is our Korean War display. and. This picture up here, I can show you where I'm at in it in Korea. In fact, I gave him this picture. I'm standing up there with a Korean walking stick over my shoulder. When we were in reserve, this is the way we lived. We lived in pup tents. We lived on the ground. Uh, you can see our, our uh, uh, sleeping bags are rolled up in a ball. You carried half of a pup tent and your buddy carried the other half and then you put them together to make your shelter. And that's the way you lived. Uh, I'll tell you a little story about coming around this way. And 
This is a picture of me, home on leave, before I went to combat training. And when I got to Korea, we found this flag, and along with a, a bunch of papers, and I, 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 I kept the flag, but I, I turned the uh, papers into the uh, information people. And uh, we, we never, we, we had a hard time figuring out what this said down here. And the problem that we had is we always, we kept asking Korean people what it was. And it's not Korean, it's Japanese. Because the Japanese had held Korea from 1905 or so all, all the way up to 1945. So we finally, we finally found out following the Re Japanese War 1904-1905 Japan took control of Korea, annexing the region in 1910. This is a 105. This is a very uh, popular artillery piece. This is what the terrain looked like in Korea. Korea is a very hilly, mountainous country. And of course that makes it harder to fight in combat because the enemy would be dug in. You can see here some digging in where the troops were, the enemy troops. And helicopters were fairly new in the Korean War, and bless them for getting the wounded back to the aid stations, because with this kind of terrain, trying to get people carried back is a real problem. So helicopters were a big, big item in, in the Korean War, and established themselves as a real military piece of equipment, which is true today both in getting supplies and both getting the wounded back to, to uh, the hospitals. There's a picture of the, There's a picture of the Chosen of Reservoir. And it's, it's really, I think it tells a whole story. Uh, this guy has got the, what we always call the thousand yard stare. Here's a guy that he, you can see the expression on his face. Why the hell can't I ride in the Jeep? Here's a guy over here, he's, he's smiling and laughing. I have no idea what, what he's smiling about. But the, I think that picture tells a story all about the Chosen Reservoir. Jet airplanes were a new item in the Korean War. They had never been, we had never had jet airplanes before in a war and uh, they played a big part in us winning the Korean War. The enemy also had jet aircraft. One thing about jet aircrafts in the Korean War, they were, they were fine in air-to-air -air combat against the Russian aircraft that the uh, North Koreans had, but to use them as support for ground troops, they, we did not have the technology to aim them because the jets were a lot faster and we did not have the technology that we did with the prop airplanes. So they, we did not use the jets as air support. We used still the prop planes in Korea for ground support for the troops. Inside of this tent is a mock-up of uh, Ford observers would, would use uh, an area like this and a radio and they would they would talk back to the individuals back into, into the uh, artillery line and they would give uh, information as to you know where, where to shoot shoot the weapon Vietnam at, uh, at one time was the longest war it, it hung on for about nine years. They would dig themselves down in the ground and they would hide in the ground and the only way you could get out was to go down in the, in the ground and get them out. And so that's what this gentleman's picking here. He, he's looking down in a hole in the ground to figure out whether there's any enemy. This gentleman's name was Larry Spencer. You know Larry, Larry was a POW. 
he was captured, and this is all he had left on for clothes when he was repatriated. This was the, the clothes that he wore, and that's the way they got fed. They got one of those cans of food like that, not every day, but that's, that's how they were fed by the enemy. But, um, what an amazing story he has to tell about the seven years he spent as a POW. This is a... Uh, these are always on the back of a ship. And they're depth charged and they're dropped for submarines. And they're submarine killers. This display here has actually got a, uh, a periscope off of a, uh, an actual uh, submarine tower. Uh, evidently, they don't use conning towers anymore. They it, do everything it, by satellite positioning. Yeah. But you can see, uh, you can see whole ba all the, almost the whole base. It, this is really popular with all the children because they get to play with it. Uh, you can't hurt it. The individual that done some of our painting mural, mural wise uh, also did this work in here. Uh, he does such good work that you, that you think you could almost uh, sit in those chairs. But Larry, one of our volunteers I know worked in here a lot all these gauges and, and uh, such. And we, and we get, well, there's a good picture of a submarine that's just being launched. I had no interest in ever being a submarine person. No. This is a replica of a, a, a torpedo carried by a submarine. Now we're getting a little bit more modern. This goes for our Gulf Wars now. And we're not finished with this display yet, but we do have artifacts and stuff that you can uh, film. That, that weapon that, that was in the 1800s, if you look up here to the, uh, on the front of that helicopter, you see them barrels? It's the same thing as that Gatling gun. Of course, it's got a lot more power, a lot, it shot a lot faster. It was well armed with rockets. This is, of course, the Humvee that's been used extensively that took it from place of the old Jeep. If you read this, it is the soldier. It is the soldier, not the poet, who gives us freedom of speech. It is the soldier, not the reporter, who gives us the freedom of press. It is the soldier, not the campus organizer, who gives us freedom to protest. It is a soldier who serves beneath the flag, who salutes the flag, flag, whose coffin is draped by the flag, and who gives a demonstrator the right to burn the flag. Uh, I think the thing, it says, it tells it all. So with that, uh, anytime you want to come back to the uh, museum, we would welcome, welcome you. We, we love to have school grade kids come in. We appreciate you coming and visiting us. Thank you.